Chapter Seventeen of History of Iceland by Knut Gjurset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Realism in Icelandic literature, modern intellectual life in Iceland the year eighteen seventy four when iceland received its constitution and entered upon a new era of national development coincided very closely with the beginning of a new period of european political and intellectual life following the franco-prussian war of eighteen seventy to eighteen seventy one that eventful conflict between the two leading european nations dispelled the romanticism which had hitherto remained bound up with the memory of napoleon's military glory and the resplendent greatness of france the war shattered the napoleonic empire and taught the world a new military science but it also created the bloody conflict in paris between the old social order and militant communism and turned the mind of europe to new political and social problems new forces also made themselves felt in european life and thought the woman's movement raised the demand for woman's rights socialistic ideas were spreading and international labor unions were organized the darwinian theory of evolution expounded and popularized by able writers like thomas huxley and herbert spencer offered a new explanation of man's life and his relation to the universe in such an age people naturally felt that they were not living in the realms of dreams but in a practical world with difficult problems which awaited their solution the inquiring and critical spirit of the age found its expression in a realistic literary movement and a literary criticism based on the new views which soon rendered archaic the romanticism of the earlier decades of the nineteenth century in iceland the new realistic literary movement began to develop about eighteen eighty the leaders of this movement were the icelandic students in copenhagen who had come under the influence of georg brandis the chief representative of this school of thought in denmark in eighteen seventy one brandis began a series of lectures at the university of copenhagen later published under the title the main currents of the nineteenth century literature romanticism and the old views were sharply assailed and the most radical ideas in politics religion philosophy and literature were advanced christian faith and national patriotism were considered antiquated remnants of an unscientific age destined to disappear in the broad daylight of modern scientific inquiry in contradistinction to the nationalists the adherents of the new movement called themselves europeans and affected an air of superiority because of their scientific reasoning and cosmopolitan views all established tenets and institutions all relations in family society and state were subjected to a searing scrutiny all human problems were discussed in this new literature which aimed to picture life as it really is most of the young authors in denmark norway and sweden were soon found in the ranks of the realists and it was natural that the icelandic students in copenhagen should also join in the new movement as the periodical fjolner had been founded as the special organ of the romanticists a new periodical Vera fondi was founded by the four young authors berthel e o thurleifsson einar kajor leifsson gesture pallison and hannes hafstein to champion the new realistic views the first number contained the poem storm by hannes hafstein the very fine short story kajor leiksche milleth by gesture pallison and another short story up og nither by einar a your leafson productions of great excellence but the verthandi lived only one year it was succeeded by two new journals suthi published in reykjavik eighteen eighty three to eighteen eighty seven and heimdallur published in copenhagen eighteen eighty four but these two died soon in the larger european countries realism performed a useful mission by making literature a weapon in the hands of social reformers but in iceland where no class distinction industrial conflicts or social problems existed it could be nothing but a new literary style little understood or appreciated by the people 
the cosmopolitan atmosphere and pessimistic critical attitude which characterized the realists was little suited to solve the problems which confronted the icelanders the reawakening of the old national spirit the romantic love of their own country the pride in their ancient traditions the confidence in their ability to make iceland as prosperous as it is beautiful fostered by the devoted enthusiasm of the romanticists had accomplished great things for iceland the critical and often negative realists could bring no such encouraging message in their effort to picture conditions in their naked reality they could only point to the shady side of life the poverty and discouraging economic conditions the solace and encouragement found in the christian faith they usually discarded the greatness of past ages they regarded as idle fancies the pessimism and discontent fostered by this attitude could only tend to swell the number of emigrants who at this time were yearly leaving iceland some of the realist leaders themselves setting the example of emigrating to america but although realism could have no direct mission in iceland as a regenerating social force it has been of great importance to modern icelandic literature and intellectual life to the realists is due in a great measure the development of the modern icelandic novel though it had begun to flourish before their time through their discussion of present-day conditions they have fostered among their people a better understanding of the modern world with its complex social life so necessary to all deeper analysis of human life in our age by discarding the rather grandiose style of the romanticists they have given literary production a sombre and critical spirit but also a cosmopolitan character which reaches beyond the purely local and national and makes the icelandic novel and drama of to-day distinct contributions to the twentieth century literary art the foremost novelists of the new school were gestar palsen eighteen fifty two to eighteen ninety one eighteen fifty six to nineteen eighteen and einar jor leifsen born december nine eighteen fifty nine gesture paulsen pursued the study of theology at the university of copenhagen but left without taking his final examinations returning to iceland in eighteen eighty two for some years he published the paper Sue three in eighteen ninety he emigrated to america settling in winnipeg canada here he became editor of the icelandic paper heimskringla but died at an early age in eighteen ninety one in his novels and short stories he pictures icelandic life and social conditions with great force and clearness dwelling especially on the misery of the poor and the greed hypocrisy and egoism of the well-to-do the leaders in society who pretend to promote the general welfare when they are only furthering their own interests are made to feel the sting of his bitter irony his delineation of character is striking and his psychological analysis of great mental struggles are true and artistically wrought his novels have been translated into german danish norwegian english and bohemian jonas jonasson was a very productive novelist devoting himself chiefly to the picturing of social conditions in ancient and modern times einar hjor leifsson attracted attention as a story writer even while attending the latin school in eighteen eighty five he emigrated to america becoming associate editor of the icelandic paper heimskringla in winnipeg canada later he served as editor of the icelandic weekly the logberg of the same city from eighteen eighty eight till eighteen ninety five when he returned to iceland he is one of the most noted and influential of icelandic writers since nineteen ten he has received a government stipend for literary work among younger icelandic novelists may be mentioned gudmundur magnusson better known by his pseudonym jan trausty eighteen seventy three to nineteen eighteen who also received an author's stipend from the government benedict bjornsson born eighteen seventy nine and gunnar gunnarsson born eighteen eighty nine hannes halfstein one of the founders of the verthandi is an idealist and a gifted lyric poet but as he became one of the leading statesmen of iceland he has accomplished less in literature than he otherwise might have done as he has been chiefly occupied with political questions in a busy public life among the foremost lyric poets of this school was thorsten erlingsson eighteen fifty eight to nineteen fourteen for a time teacher in copenhagen in religion he was an evolutionist in political views a radical his poems were written to serve as a vehicle for his radical and evolutionistic political and social views einar benedictson 
born eighteen sixty four as a lyric poet of great power in nineteen o three he organized the political party known as the land varnar floker or party of national defence which opposed the amendment to the constitution proposed by the government since nineteen o seven he has lived abroad usually in england the icelandic dramatic literature has found able representatives in johan sigurd jansson eighteen eighty to nineteen nineteen and gud munder kamben born in eighteen eighty eight both have written dramas which have been played with success also in many foreign lands in the field of religious literature valdemar Briam, born february one eighteen forty eight has distinguished himself as one of the great hymn writers in the north since nineteen o nine he has been vice-bishop of the scalholt diocese he was a member of the committee appointed to prepare a new hymn-book also of the committee on ritual for the icelandic church Briam has written many collections of hymns in eighteen eighty six the committee of which he was a member gave iceland a new hymn-book of the six hundred and fifty hymns which it contains one hundred and forty two are by him the hymn-book edited by magnus stevenson in seventeen eighty one had been in use till eighteen seventy one when a revised edition was published this was superseded in eighteen eighty six by the new hymn-book which is still in use in nineteen twelve appeared a new bible translation the first icelandic bible translation from the original texts the translation of the old testament was done by haraldur nielsen professor of theology in the university of reykjavik the new testament was translated by bishop thor holler or jarn narsen jan helgeson professor of theology in the university of reykjavik and eiriker Briam, instructor in the same university the cost of publishing was defrayed by the english bible society in the various fields of learning the icelanders have shown increased productivity during this period in history archaeology mathematics and natural science they have able writers in philology and northern antiquities they have especially distinguished themselves a noted scholar in this field was Irikur magnuson born eighteen thirty three and educated at the theological school in reykjavik in eighteen sixty two he went to england to superintend the publication of an icelandic bible translation was appointed assistant librarian at the university of cambridge and became m a of trinity college in eighteen ninety three in england he devoted himself especially to the translation and publication of old icelandic literature his chief work of this kind was the saga library saga translations by Erikur magnusson and william morris published in london in eighteen ninety he has written articles on northern mythology and antiquities in various publications also articles dealing with political and social conditions in his own country finner jansen born at Akurari, in northern iceland in eighteen fifty eight became instructor and finally professor of icelandic language and literature in the university of copenhagen and has long been regarded as one of the greatest scholars in this field of his numerous works on literature history and philology may be mentioned den old norske og ildislandske litteratur i history a compendious and scholarly work in three volumes he has been knighted and is a member of many literary and learned societies bjorn m olsen a distinguished scholar was born in northern iceland july fourteen eighteen fifty died january sixteen nineteen nineteen after completing his studies at the university of copenhagen he travelled in italy and greece upon his return home he became teacher in the latin school at reykjavik and in eighteen ninety five he was chosen rector of that institution from nineteen eleven until nineteen eighteen he was professor in the university of reykjavik of which institution he became the first rector he has written many works on literary and philological subjects voltaire goodmanson born in eighteen sixty is also a noted philologist since eighteen ninety he has been professor in the university of copenhagen in eighteen ninety six he visited the united states at the invitation of mrs cornelia horsford to examine ruins in massachusetts supposed to be of norse origin he has written many works dealing with northern antiquities of icelandic historians must be mentioned bogey the 
melstead a grandson of the poet bjarni thorarinson born in eighteen sixty he is the author of many works among others of icelandin saga a large history of iceland of which two volumes have appeared he resides in copenhagen and receives a stipend from the icelandic government for continuing his historical research jan jansen eighteen sixty nine to nineteen twenty also received a stipend as historian from the icelandic government from nineteen eleven he was professor of history in the university of reykjavik his works on the history of iceland are many among others may be mentioned his iceland saga a short history of iceland jan thorgerson the younger born in eighteen fifty nine editor of diplomatarium islandicum is director of the national archives in reykjavik and one of the founders of the icelandic historical society of his historical works may be mentioned om dignengen pa island edet fifteen de og sixteen odd r hundred eighteen eighty eight and saga jorundar hunda dags kong so eighteen ninety two in the field of art little had been accomplished in iceland till the latter part of the nineteenth century in earlier times the icelanders had skilled wood-carvers tapestry weavers and metal workers as can be seen from numerous articles in the reykjavik museum in the national museum in copenhagen and in the nordiska musette in stockholm but these activities had gradually declined owing no doubt to the poverty and general misery prevalent in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries but the new intellectual awakening and improved economic conditions revived also the long neglected artistic talents of the people and there is now a prospect of a rich contribution of modern icelandic art sigurdur gudmundsen eighteen thirty three to eighteen seventy four was a talented painter he founded the reykjavik national museum and devoted himself to the history of art especially of his own country these activities consumed so much of his time that he found little opportunity to produce original works of his own but he rendered valuable service by rekindling the love of art among his countrymen Thorarin, thor Lachsen and asgrimur jansen have shown great talent especially as painters of icelandic landscapes einar jansen born in eighteen seventy four is iceland's first sculptor many of his works as dawn evolution emir og ad humla and monument to queen victoria have attracted wide attention he has also sculptured monuments of jonas hallgrimsen jan sigurdsson king christian the ninth and ingolf arnarson probably his greatest production is the outlaw in which he has delineated with powerful realism in the facial expression of the central figure as well as in the composition of the whole group the tragedy of hopeless struggle against the curse of a people pursuing the offender even into the recesses of an uninhabitable wilderness with face set in defiance but furrowed with anxiety the outlaw carries on his back the body of his dead wife to inter her remains in consecrated soil his right hand rests on a spade on his left arm he carries his child wrapped in a sheepskin clinging to him confidingly in its helplessness and his shaggy half-starved dog follows him with a shy and wondering look the agony of suffering and hopeless loneliness could scarcely be more pathetically portrayed the icelandic state has brought the sculptor's works to iceland where they are preserved as a treasure of national art in music the icelanders have made great progress since the middle of the nineteenth century before that time little had been done to cultivate this art the church hymns were sung in a primitive way to the earliest old melodies of musical instruments only a few crude string instruments were in use especially the langspil peter gud jansen eighteen twelve to eighteen seventy seven and jonas helgeson eighteen thirty nine to nineteen o three both organists in the cathedral in reykjavik did much to create interest both in vocal and instrumental music organs are now found in nearly all icelandic churches played by organists who have studied music in reykjavik in the towns pianos are found in the homes of the more well-to-do and the guitar and violin are in common use of late years icelandic composers have appeared the most prominent being svein bjorn svein 
Bjornsson, born in 1847, for a long time a resident of Edinburgh, Scotland. His compositions with English texts have been published there. Of other Icelandic composers may be mentioned Bjarni, Thor Steinsson, born 1861, Sigfus Einarsson, Arne Thor Steinsson, Jan Fried Janssen, and Helga Helgeson. The system of public education has of late years been brought to a very high state of completeness and efficiency in Iceland. A school of jurisprudence was established in 1908. In 1911, this school and those of medicine and theology were consolidated into the University of Iceland, and a department of philosophy was added on june seventeenth of that year this university was dedicated with fitting ceremonies of other institutions of learning there is one latin school or college located at reykjavik two popular high schools four agricultural schools and one nautical school the facilities for study and research have also been greatly increased the national library in reykjavik containing rich stores of the best books of all lands together with large manuscript collections has continued to grow until it is now the most complete collection of icelandic books in the world the national archives covering the last two hundred years of icelandic history are also very complete the national antiquarian museum in reykjavik contains a collection of more than five thousand five hundred articles and the natural history museum founded in eighteen eighty nine contains nearly all specimens of fishes plants and birds in iceland also in the field of vocational training able instruction has been provided and great progress has been made the industrial exposition in reykjavik in nineteen eleven showed roven tapestries and hand-carved articles of wood and whalebone wrought with rare taste and skill of workmanship showing that these old arts in which the people used to excel in earlier ages are being revived under the stimulus of a new intellectual awakening and social development which has placed iceland among the most progressive as well as the most enlightened of modern nations End of chapter seventeen Chapter 18 of History of Iceland by Knut Kjurset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The struggle for independence, Iceland proclaimed a sovereign state, recent economic development. The constitution granted in 1874 contained many features distasteful to the Icelanders. It was accepted as a first installment of liberty in the hope that new concessions could be obtained later, but it was evident that the people were not satisfied with an autonomy so imperfectly accomplished. It is said that the first time King Christian the Ninth met jan sigurdsson after the millennial festivities he asked him if the icelanders were satisfied with the constitution to which sigurdsson replied that since the chief wish of the icelanders had not been granted his majesty could not expect them to be satisfied this answer expressed very pointedly the relation existing between the two countries no one could doubt that the constitutional struggle would be renewed though king and government were sure to falter at every step towards a more perfect democracy the icelanders wished their administration to be entrusted to native officials residing in reykjavik but it was still directed from copenhagen no minister for icelandic affairs had ever been appointed as provided in the constitution the management of these matters had been left to the danish minister of justice who had often advised the king to veto bills passed by the all thing when jan sigurdsson died in eighteen seventy nine his able lieutenant benedict Sveinsson, at one time associate justice of the lands and later sis lu mather of thinge yarsle reopened the constitutional conflict by proposing in eighteen eighty one a revision of the constitution according to the plan submitted both the office of lands show thingy and that of minister for iceland were to be abolished and an icelandic administrative government was to be created in reykjavik consisting of a viceroy with a ministry of not more than three members appointed by himself but responsible to the althing to become law 
all bills passed by the all thing had to be signed by the king or by the viceroy who should exercise full royal power constitutional amendments should be signed by the king in person the ministers if accused should be tried by a special tribunal consisting of some members of the upper branch of the all thing and the justice of the lands of Etter, or highest icelandic court all members of the all thing thirty-six in number should be popularly chosen and a supreme court of appeal was to be created for iceland this proposed revision was submitted to every session of the all thing till eighteen ninety five it was always passed by the lower branch but meant determined opposition in the upper branch it was at last passed by two succeeding all things as provided in the constitution that is eighteen eighty five and eighteen eighty six eighteen ninety three and eighteen ninety four but it was promptly vetoed by the king in the reasons for the royal veto submitted november two eighteen eighty five it was stated that it would be a violation of the danish constitution and of iceland's position as an inseparable part of the danish kingdom furthermore the proposed changes would also entail too big expenses for so poor a country as iceland the more moderate political leaders in seeking a way out of the difficulty began to consider acceptable compromises in eighteen eighty nine sigurdur stephenson jan jensen ira kerr Briam, and paul Briam framed such a compromise the mythlon patterned on the government of the dominion of canada but it was not passed by the all thing in the session of eighteen ninety five the majority of the members resolved to drop the old revision plan which was again submitted in its place a resolution was passed requesting the government to submit a plan for revision but this request was also rejected by the government among the people great confusion prevailed some were in favour of continuing the struggle along the lines hitherto followed others thought that this would be useless because of the determined opposition of the government but all agreed that the existing conditions could no longer be tolerated in eighteen ninety seven voltier gudmundsen professor in the university of copenhagen who had been elected member of the all thing submitted a compromise plan in order to shape an issue which might gain general support according to this plan nearly all the main provisions in the constitution were to be retained but a minister for iceland capable of speaking the icelandic language should have a seat in the all thing should take part in its deliberations and should be responsible to it for all his official acts this provision however if carried through would bring about a greater change than at first apparent as it would virtually establish parliamentary government it is therefore quite noteworthy that the government agreed to accept the plan the bill was passed in the upper branch of the all thing but in the lower branch it was defeated by a majority of three votes in eighteen ninety nine it was again passed by the upper branch but failed to pass in the lower the plan did not provide for an icelandic administration in Reykjavik, as the icelandic minister should remain in copenhagen in consequence it failed to pass as it did not solve the constitutional question in a way satisfactory to the majority of the people the election of nineteen hundred gave the supporters of gudmundsson's bill a slight majority in nineteen o one it was introduced in the all thing for the third time in a slightly altered form and was passed by both branches the bill provided for an increase in the number of popularly chosen representatives to thirty-four eight of whom should sit in the upper branch in order that the popularly chosen representatives might be in the majority in both branches of the assembly suffrage was extended to all male citizens not servants twenty-five years of age who were paying a yearly tax of four kroner the sessions of the all things should last for two months even before the measure had been voted upon in this upper branch word was received that a liberal ministry had been formed in denmark and that a dane had been appointed minister for iceland a memorial was therefore addressed to the king stating that a fully satisfactory solution of the constitutional question could be reached only when the icelanders received a government of their own residing in reykjavik 
to this memorial the king returned a very favorable answer saying that the desired modifications of the constitution among others also that a minister for iceland capable of speaking the icelandic language and taking part in the deliberations of the althing would be granted that a government proposal would be submitted to the next session of that assembly containing a plan for establishing an icelandic ministry in reykjavik in the next election the home rule party was victorious the government proposal providing for an icelandic minister residing in reykjavik was submitted to the althing and was passed by both branches new elections were ordered in nineteen o three the home rule party again receiving a majority the government amendments to the constitution passed almost unanimously by the new althing received royal sanction october three nineteen o three iceland had now received home rule the revised constitution which was to become effective february one nineteen o four abolished the office of lands show thingy likewise those of the two amtmen the icelandic minister was to reside in reykjavik he was to be able to speak and write icelandic and should take part in the deliberations of the all thing and should be responsible to it for all his official acts from time to time he should go to copenhagen to lay before the king and cabinet meeting bills and other important matters the all things should be assembled july one every other year and should remain in session eight weeks it was to consist of forty members thirty-four of whom should be elected by the people and six to be appointed by the king in organizing itself for legislative work it should divide into two branches the efri or upper branch to consist of fourteen members and the nethri Yield, or lower branch of twenty-six members male citizens not servants and paying a yearly tax of four kroner should have the right to vote mayor and sislu mother hannes Afstein was appointed minister for iceland there can be no doubt that the danish government at this time made an earnest effort to solve the constitutional controversy in a manner satisfactory to the icelanders and all hoped that political peace and good understanding would now prevail but the changing of an old conservative fundamental law to fit a new time spirit is something like the task of remodelling an old house one change necessitates another and many alterations will have to be made which at first were neither foreseen nor contemplated together with the provision in the revised constitution that the icelandic minister should reside in reykjavik it was stipulated that he should submit to the king at meetings of the cabinet new laws and other important matters for his signature this had been done and could easily be done so long as the minister resided in copenhagen but no provision in the constitution had existed regarding this matter already in the summer of nineteen o two before the constitutional amendments were passed anonymous writers began to oppose this provision in the revised constitution and sought to prevent its adoption a new party was formed led by judge jan jensen and the political leader bjarni jansen to oppose this feature of the revision program this new group calling themselves landvarnar floker or party of national defence soon received the support of the conservatives now calling themselves the progressive party from soak narflaker who also were opposed to the minister this opposition to the new administration became as formidable as it was determined the cry was raised that through the revised constitution iceland had been incorporated in the danish kingdom that the law of eighteen seventy one regarding iceland's relation to the realm had been accepted vigorous objection was also raised because the danish authorities had signed the appointment of afstein as icelandic minister as this indicated that they still wished to exert influence on purely icelandic affairs with regard to the provision in the constitution that bills passed by the all things should be submitted to the king in cabinet meeting it was demanded that icelandic affairs should be separated from those of denmark and should not be laid before the king in the meeting of the whole cabinet as this would give his danish advisers the right to deliberate and decide on purely icelandic matters and would still make the icelandic government subservient to the danish authorities 
up till nineteen o four the danes had always taken for granted that iceland was an integral part of the danish kingdom even when important concessions were made to the icelanders in their struggle for national autonomy it had been assumed that no other relation could exist between the two countries to this view the icelanders had never acceded as a rule they held the view of their great leader jan sigurdsson who had made it clear that after the king had renounced his absolute power the gamli sat mali was the sole remaining union agreement according to this view the more aggressive leaders claimed that only a confederate union existed between denmark and iceland as had been established between norway and iceland in twelve sixty two we have seen that according to the gamli sit mali the icelanders were to retain their own laws and institutions their national assembly and full control of their own affairs but they promised to receive a jarl or governor-general appointed by the king to act as his deputy it was unfortunate that the danish statesmen should have become so attached to the idea of the unity of the realm as to insist that under all circumstances iceland must be considered an integral part of the danish kingdom they had already made great concessions to the national aspiration of the icelanders but their theory gave offence the struggle was carried into the realm of principle like the taxation controversy between the american colonies and king george the third rendering practical adjustments difficult in the light of such a theory the icelanders could only view all bonds which united them with denmark as fetters designed to keep them in a state of inferiority and subjugation questions were sure to arise about icelandic commerce flag and other important matters as they had done in norway and sweden under similar circumstances political peace and mutual goodwill between the two partners in the union could be established only by recognizing their essential equality no one could doubt that the struggle would continue until iceland's complete independence as a sovereign nation should be definitely acknowledged when the all thing assembled in nineteen o five the chief measure under consideration was a proposal submitted by the minister hall halfstein regarding a projected plan for telegraphic and telephone service in iceland the great northern telegraph company had agreed to lay a telegraphic cable to the faroe islands and iceland if subsidies were granted by the icelandic government in the plan submitted it was provided that such a subsidy should be granted together with funds for the construction of the telegraph and telephone lines between southern and northern iceland since eighteen ninety one this project has been discussed and a strong sentiment had been created in its favour but the opposition backed by the paper isafold began a determined fight against it in an effort to defeat the minister securing an offer from the Maconi company of wireless telegraphic service to iceland they held that this would be cheaper and argued that the subsidies necessary to secure the projected cable would drain the treasury as thorough investigation finally showed that the cable would be the safest and most advantageous telegraphic connection to be secured the bill was passed october twenty eighth nineteen o five the following year a cable was laid to sadisfjord and telegraph and telephone lines were soon extended to akurairi and reykjavik the political events in norway in nineteen o five which led to the dissolution of the swedish norwegian union gave added strength to the demands of the icelanders for complete independence when frederick the eighth ascended the throne in nineteen o six he extended an invitation to the icelandic althing to visit denmark on the voyage from iceland the representatives discussed the question of iceland's position in the union and agreed on the following points a joint commission consisting of members of the danish rigsdag and the icelandic all things should be appointed to draft a new law defining iceland's position in the realm to take the place of the law of eighteen seventy one the annuity paid by denmark to iceland should be converted into a fixed sum to be paid to the icelandic treasury the name iceland should be added to the king's title so that it should henceforth read king of denmark and iceland and the appointment of a minister for iceland should be signed either by that minister himself or by his predecessor in office on july twenty ninth the althing representatives were received in the rigsdag 
building by a large danish delegation during their visit they set forth the plan agreed upon on the voyage this was courteously received king expressing the hope that he would be able to visit iceland the following summer on behalf of iceland the althing representatives extended a formal invitation to the king and forty members of the rigsdag and in the summer of nineteen o seven king frederick the eighth visited iceland accompanied by the rigsdag delegation shortly after his arrival a commission was appointed consisting of thirteen danes and seven icelanders to draft a new law defining iceland's position in the union but elections had not been held for some time and the members of the althing were no longer in sympathy with the prevailing political sentiment for this reason the liberal party groups demanded an election before the appointment of the commission in order that the members when appointed might represent the prevailing public opinion but minister hafstein supported by the heim ast jornormen or home rule party which favoured a strong union with denmark disregarded this demand and the icelandic members were chosen from the old all thing representation the commission assembled in copenhagen february twenty eighth nineteen o eight in may of the same year it submitted a draft of a new law defining iceland's position in the realm according to its provisions iceland should be a free and autonomous country united with denmark under a common king and through such joint matters as should be specified in the proposed law the name iceland should be inserted in the king's title as the icelanders desired the royal treasury should pay to the treasury of iceland once for all the sum of one million five hundred thousand kroner and thereby the financial question between the two countries should be settled the joint matters were to be a common king foreign affairs and defence on land and sea together with the same flag protection of the fisheries common right of citizenship and a common supreme court no treaties should be made regarding affairs in which icelanders was interested unless the icelandic government was consulted the icelanders should have the right with the consent of denmark to increase their supervision of the fisheries and territorial waters they might also grant a citizenship which should be in force in denmark and they might establish a supreme tribunal for icelandic cases if the constitutions of both countries were amended to this effect it was also provided that a judge should be appointed to the danish supreme court who possessed knowledge of the icelandic language and government affairs danes and icelanders should enjoy the same right respectively in denmark and iceland they should also have the same right to participate in the fisheries and territorial waters of the two countries but denmark should exercise protective control icelandic students should be granted stipends by preference and the icelanders in iceland should be exempt from military service when twenty-five years had elapsed after the passage of the law it should be revised if either the danish rigsdag or the icelandic althing should demand it after thirty-seven years either denmark or iceland might demand a complete separation in all matters except those of a common king foreign affairs and defence all the icelandic members of the commission with the exception of skuli thoradsen signed the draft of the proposed law Schooley refused to sign and submitted a report of his own in which he said the icelanders will not be satisfied except it be clearly stated that iceland is a sovereign state that it controls all its affairs and stands on an equal footing with denmark only with the common king temporarily but this according to my opinion is not possible since certain affairs foreign affairs and national defence are exempted from revocation and given into the hands of the danish government so that iceland can have no part in their control or can assume management of them without asking the consent of the danish law-making assembly minister hafstein had been one of the most active members of the commission but the opposition to the law which he had helped to frame was very determined Schooley thoradsen's party the from so gnar floker or progressive party which after nineteen o five called itself the p u thur this floker or popular government party opposed it so did also the land varnar floker or national defence party led by judge jan jensen and bjarni jansen these parties feared that the new law according to which iceland should still be a part of the danish kingdom would only rivet more firmly the chains which bound them to denmark 
iceland was not to have her own flag and the request that icelandic affairs should not be considered in meetings of the danish cabinet had not been granted in their opinion the new law would only be a covenant giving sanction and permanence to existing conditions only a compromise which would be sure to retard the work for national independence together the two parties had called a convention at thingbeller june twenty ninth nineteen o seven this assembly passed resolutions demanding that the covenant to be established between denmark and iceland regarding the relation of the two countries should expressly acknowledge the iceland to be a free country united with denmark under a joint king and possessing full equality with the danish kingdom and full sovereign control over its own affairs it was further to be understood that this covenant could be abrogated by either party to the compact a proposal was also adopted that iceland should have its own flag consisting of a white cross on a blue field resolutions were passed protesting against any covenant falling short of these demands stating that nothing but complete separation of the two countries was possible if such conditions were not granted after this meeting the popular government party still led by scully thoridson called itself the svalve stead thur floker or independence party and its political program became complete separation from denmark jan jensen one of the leaders of the landvarnar floker or party of national defence now left his party and gave his support to minister halfstein and the heimast jornar men or home rule party but the landvarnar floker led by bjarni jansen continued to oppose halfstein a violent agitation against the proposed law was begun supported by the paper isafold and its able editor bjorn jansen in the elections held september tenth nineteen o eight the first in iceland in which the australian system of secret ballot was used the opponents of the proposed measure were victorious of the eight thousand one hundred and forty six votes cast three thousand four hundred and seventy five votes were res registered for the measure and four thousand six hundred and seventy one against it the opposition had elected twenty four members to the all thing its supporters only ten when the new all thing assembled it passed a vote of lack of confidence in the ministry and afstein resigned in april nineteen o nine he was succeeded by bjorn jansen editor of the isafold one of the leaders of the opposition who had been chosen president of the all thing the new minister promised to work for a better understanding between iceland and denmark and it was agreed that the measure regarding iceland's position in the realm should not be submitted to the althing instead the althing majority passed a new measure declaring iceland to be a free and sovereign kingdom united with denmark under a joint king and through such common affairs as might be agreed upon while remaining in office bjorn jansen was especially occupied with the question regarding the management of the bank of iceland even before his appointment rumours had been abroad that the bank management had been lax with regard to loans on real estate and the, to the fisheries charges were also made against the cashier of the bank halder jansen the new minister appointed a committee to examine the status of the bank it was found that it had suffered heavy losses but that these were covered by a reserve fund which would show a credit balance of two hundred and fifty thousand kroner after all losses were paid as to the officials of the bank the committee found that no blame could attach to them the minister however did not feel wholly reassured having lost confidence in the bank officials he removed the cashier halder jansen the two controlling directors k r jansen and iriker briam and the general manager trig v gunnarsson a man of great business ability and member of the all thing for many years this aroused general resentment as the people felt that the removed bank officials had been unjustly treated at a big mass meeting in reykjavik in which to seven thousand people are said to have participated the following resolution was drafted the people assembled protest against minister bjorn jansen's treatment of the bank officials and regard his action to be an arbitrary use of official power as well as a flagrant disregard of the true interests and honour of iceland since the people assembled find his action to be a positive proof that he can no longer be tolerated in the high office which he now holds they demand his immediate resignation the leading merchants of reykjavik also addressed to him sharp letters of protest when he refused to reinstate the bank officials after they had been declared blameless by the investigation committee his former friend judge k r johnson one of the 
removed directors brought suit against him for personal injury and defamation of character pleading that since he had not been appointed by the government but had been elected by the all thing the government had no jurisdiction in the matter and could not remove him the case was decided in his favour the minister appealed to the lansif fur retter but the decision of the lower court was sustained even then the minister would not yield his paper isofold announced that a new appeal would be taken to the danish hersteret or supreme court but the case was never brought before that tribunal judge keor jansen was satisfied with his legal victory and did not resume his office as bank director the althing representatives also mixed in the fight many of them demanding a special session of the althing in order that the bank question might be considered by the people's chosen representatives party feeling ran high both in iceland and in denmark in copenhagen many leaders assembled to protest against the separation movement which it was claimed was headed by minister bjorn jansen himself even many icelanders took part in this meeting to deprecate this movement a personal union would be equivalent to separation they claimed and separation would mean the ruin of iceland no one spoke more vehemently than the young icelandic lawyer svein bjornsson i see the danger to the union between denmark mark and iceland he said in the fact that minister bjorn jansen stands at the head of a party which openly works for separation of the two countries when he comes to denmark he talks in another tone but he cannot be trusted this i tell you members of the government who are here present he is a man who either lacks reason or suffers himself to be controlled by unscrupulous men a danish journalist proposed to send a warship to iceland to arrest the leaders of the independence party such hysterical outbursts found little favour with the people of denmark but the secession movement supported by a radical group in iceland which in nineteen ten passed a resolution declaring that absolute separation was the only proper solution of the union question created genuine alarm minister bjorn jansen was a strong and upright man an energetic worker ever ready to aid any one in need or in distress he always remained faithful to his purpose of rendering efficient and unselfish public service in the high office to which he had been appointed as leader of the prohibition forces he succeeded in passing the prohibition law which received a majority vote in both branches of the all thing in nineteen o nine and was signed by the king in june the same year in spite of the opposition of several european nations including spain but his stand on the bank question and his views regarding iceland's relation to denmark aroused a strong opposition which constantly grew more hostile and determined in nineteen eleven schooley thorodson the leader of the independence party and others introduced in the althing a motion of lack of confidence in the minister the motion was passed with a small majority and bjorn jansen resigned while he remained in office his paper isofold was edited by his son olaf bjornsson through the father's political defeat the paper lost prestige and support to such an extent that olaf no longer dared to accept articles written by him for this reason bjorn jansen founded a new paper magni in which he defended his position in the bank question as well as on the very important question touching iceland's relation to denmark the this flocker hoped that the king would now appoint the leader of their party schooley thoridson to succeed bjorn jansen as minister as twenty-one members of the althing gave him their enthusiastic support but the king selected instead keor jansen chief justice of the lands Sifur Retter, who was a member of schooley's party jansen accepted the office incurring the bitter enmity of all his former political friends a large mass meeting was assembled in reykjavik to protest against his course of action in accepting the office as he was not supported by a majority of the popularly chosen representatives in the all thing so bitter was the feeling that he was formally ousted from the party the same day a motion for a vote of lack of confidence in the new minister was introduced in the all thing it was passed in the lower branch but was not put to a vote in the upper branch jansen therefore continued to hold his office though he was no longer regarded as the leader of any party group in the press he was violently assailed the liberal leaders claiming that he had violated the principle of parliamentary government to satisfy his own personal vanity the new minister was born at gautlandum in thingayarsla in eighteen fifty two he had been sislumother in gulbringusla later judge in the landsey 
and since nineteen o eight chief justice for many years he had been controlling director in the bank of iceland and royally appointed representative to the althing when he assumed the office of minister he emphasized in a speech to the althing that his policy was be to create peace and good understanding and to secure the passage of a much-needed finance law in april nineteen eleven the hindmast your norman or home rule party which supported him introduced a bill for amending the constitution stipulating that the all thing henceforth should consist of forty members all of whom should be elected by the people all men and women twenty-one years of age should have the right to vote for all thing representatives the executive branch of the government should consist of three ministers responsible to the all thing proportional party representation was also provided for the measure was passed by the all thing but since it was a constitutional amendment it would have to be passed anew after another general election before it could be submitted to the king for his signature in the summer of nineteen eleven a bill was also introduced in the althing providing for a separate flag for iceland to consist of a white cross on a blue field this raised another important issue as denmark regarded it as another step in the direction of complete separation of the two countries the icelanders held that without a flag of their own they had no national emblem expressive of their nationality that the danish flag flying on their ships and public buildings were was only a token of danish overlordship the old thing however failed to pass the bill k r jansen and his supporters did not secure a majority in the next general election he therefore tendered his resignation and was again appointed chief justice in the landsifer etter in july nineteen twelve hannes hofstein succeeded him as minister the same year the general prohibition law for iceland passed three years before during the ministry of jorn jansen took effect in so far as it affected importation of liquors according to this law no liquors containing more than two and one half per cent of alcohol can be imported except for medical industrial and chemical use it is noteworthy that in passing this great social reform iceland was several years in advance of other nations when Abstein for the second time entered upon his duties as minister thirty-one members of the althing declared that they would unite in bringing about a solution of the union question by making such changes in the plan of nineteen o eight as would meet with the approval of the majority of the voters and would lead to a final agreement with denmark in his speech to the althing Halfstein had called attention to the unfavourable economic condition of the country saying money is wanting credit is lacking icelandic bonds cannot be sold in foreign markets and sympathy with civilization and desire for progress are decreasing why is this i am convinced that it is no exaggeration to state that one of the chief causes is dissension quarrels and party strife at home together with unsettled disputes abroad this weakens confidence creates gloom and increases all that which is inimical to cultural endeavour hindering the increase of the true capital of culture which is required in order to turn credit to profitable account it is my conviction that one of the first steps to be taken in order to remedy this trouble is to bring about a satisfactory settlement of the disputes with our sister nation the danes regarding the union question which so long has diverted the attention from other important matters and in later years has added fuel to strife and disunion in our own country in the fall of nineteen twelve minister Halfstein went to copenhagen to confer with the danish government about the resumption of negotiations on the union question in these preliminary conferences it was pointed out by the danish leaders that since the plan of nineteen o eight had been rejected by the althing the icelanders would have to submit new proposals before the negotiations could be resumed upon his return to iceland Halfstein sought the advice of a number of althing representatives a new plan was outlined which the minister said was neither his own nor one com proposed by the danish government but which it was hoped would gain the sanction of the danish authorities when it was published it met determined opposition the paper isafold considered it wholly undesirable and the whole liberal icelandic press rejected it in the fall of nineteen thirteen a new revision of the constitution was submitted to the althing based on the plan of nineteen eleven but differing from it on many points this measure was finally passed in both branches of the assembly it provided for an icelandic minister popular election of all representatives to the althing proportional party representation women's suffrage in general elections and eligibility to all offices
the question of a separate flag for iceland had also been debated repeatedly in the althing but the measure had met with defeat in the upper branch of the assembly finally on november twenty two nineteen thirteen the king sanctioned an icelandic proposal for a separate flag with the understanding that it should be so designed as not to resemble too closely the flags of other nations and that the danish flag should always be hoisted with it on government buildings in the next general elections the opponents of minister hafstein secured a majority of the all thing representatives he accordingly tendered his resignation and was succeeded by sigurdur eggers who was appointed minister for iceland july five nineteen fourteen shortly after eggers appointment followed the outbreak of the world war and serious problems confronted the icelanders the old thing took steps to safeguard the country as far as possible laws were passed providing that necessaries of life such as grain coal salt petroleum machine oil fishing gear and medical supplies should be bought by the government that the ready money in the treasury should be used for this purpose so far as it could be spared that a loan of five hundred thousand kroner should be negotiated for such purchases and that public expenses should be curtailed the export of necessaries of life was prohibited and a commission was appointed to assist the government in taking the necessary steps to safeguard the country in an address to the all thing august three nineteen fourteen minister eggers called attention to the problems confronting the government the proposed revision of the constitution was still pending so also the question of a separate flag for iceland he expressed the hope that the king would sanction these measures and that the people would then turn their minds to internal affairs we ought to devote more attention to our farming and husbandry than heretofore he continued the fisheries must be developed the means of communication on land and sea must be improved the icelandic steamship company especially should be encouraged he expressed the hope that in those perilous times the government and the legislature would cooperate in every way in the protection of the country so that no apprehension of danger would need to be entertained a commission appointed to consider the eventual design of the icelandic flag found that the one hitherto used consisting of a white cross on a blue shield could not be adopted as it resembled too closely the flags of sweden and of greece a new design would have to be submitted the revision of the constitution passed in nineteen thirteen was again brought before the all thing in nineteen fourteen and was passed a second time by both branches of the assembly without change the king had promised that if the amendments passed in nineteen thirteen should again be passed unchanged by a new all thing he would sanction the measure with the understanding however that no change could be made in the practice which had hitherto obtained that all measures should be submitted to the king in cabinet meeting to this practice the king stated he would adhere until he had sanctioned a law regarding the relation between denmark and iceland agreed to by both the rigsdag and the all thing which should establish a different regulation the commission appointed to consider the design of the icelandic flag submitted a report commending that the flag should consist of a red cross with white borders on a blue field it was hoped that minister eggers in going to copenhagen would secure the king's signature to both measures but word was soon received that he had failed in his mission in the negotiations with the minister the king reiterated his promise to sign the measures but with the proviso that they should be presented in cabinet meeting this in the opinion of the minister raised the issue whether icelandic measures were to be regarded as joint matters to be considered by the whole cabinet or as separate icelandic affairs he refused to yield on this point which he regarded as a vital issue and tendered his resignation december nineteen fourteen early in nineteen fifteen the king invited three members of the independence party to denmark for consultation on the union question one of these was einar arnarson who was soon appointed to succeed eggers as minister for iceland arnarson born in eighteen eighty was still very young but he was already a prominent jurist in nineteen o eight he became instructor in law in the university of reykjavik in nineteen eleven he was made professor of jurisprudence in nineteen fourteen he was elected member of the all thing where he quickly rose into prominence as leader of the independence party he had written several works dealing with the relation of iceland to norway and denmark opposing the views of the danish professor knud berlin he maintained that danish authorities had no right whatever to meddle with icelandic affairs in iceland a movement was developed in opposition to what was regarded as too supine an attitude on the part of the all thing in the union question complaint was made that important decisions on vital icelandic questions had been left to the king
the supporters of this movement which finally led to the organization of a new progressive group were found especially among the adherents of the independence party they demanded a vigorous national policy and active efforts in promoting icelandic enterprises arneson's visit in copenhagen to carry on private negotiations with the king regarding the union question had aroused suspicion and ill-will among the members of this group would he too suffer the king to exert a controlling influence over icelandic affairs when arsenison entered upon the duties of his office they convoked large public meetings in reykjavik demanding that he should cause the althing to be dissolved in order that new elections might be held but the minister had sufficient support in the althing to remain in office the negotiations regarding the icelandic flag and union question were renewed and since the new minister did not urge the question regarding the submitting of icelandic matters in cabinet meetings as his predecessor had done the king sanctioned both measures june nineteen nineteen fifteen in accordance with the report of the committee appointed to consider the design of the flag it was to consist of a red cross with white borders on a blue field it should be used within the country and in icelandic territorial waters but the danish flag should be hoisted with it on government buildings the design of the icelandic coat of arms was also changed by royal order of nineteen o three it was decreed that it should be a silver falcon on a blue field still earlier it had consisted of a device in which a split codfish was the principal feature in nineteen fifteen it received its present symbolic and attractive design according to the constitutional amendments passed by the althing in nineteen thirteen and nineteen fourteen and sanctioned by the king in nineteen fifteen there should be an icelandic ministry in reykjavik responsible to the althing and taking part in its deliberations the number of cabinet members to be fixed by law the icelandic prime minister should hold no other office he should be able to speak and write icelandic and should go to copenhagen to present bills and other important matters to the king for his signature the old thing has forty members but this number can be changed by law it is divided into two branches the efri dield or upper branch consisting of fourteen members and the nethri dield or lower branch or of twenty-six members the number of members in both branches can be changed by law thirty-four of the althing representatives are elected directly by their constituencies within their respective districts for a period of six years six representatives are chosen at large and according to proportional party representation for the period of twelve years these six members have seats in the upper branch of the assembly the other eight members constituting it are chosen by the thirty-four representatives elected in the districts from their own number at the assembling of the althing only one half of the total number of representatives are chosen at each election men and women twenty-five years of age who have resided in the country five years immediately preceding the election can vote for the district representatives men and women thirty-five years of age can vote for the representatives elected at large the all thing meets july first every other year but extra sessions must be called by the king when a majority of both branches demand it such sessions last only four weeks unless the time is prolonged by the king by law of nineteen sixteen the number of members of the icelandic cabinet was fixed at three minister einar arneson now resigned and the king invited jan magnusson to form a cabinet according to the new provision the members of this cabinet were jan magnusson leader of the heinmas jornar min or home rule party bjorn christiansen leader of the majority faction of the schall fast stayed bis flocker or independent party and sigurdar jansen of the newly organized benda flocker or agrarian party this coalition was created at the request of the party leaders to secure the greatest possible cooperation in view of the difficult situation caused by the world war the three parties represented in the ministry controlled thirty-six out of the twenty total forty votes in the all thing in nineteen seventeen bjorn christiansen minister of finance in the new ministry resigned and former minister for iceland sigurdur eggers was appointed to succeed him through their constitution as finally amended the icelanders had established complete democracy in their political institutions parliamentary government unrestricted suffrage for men and women and a legislative assembly elected by the people 
they had gained control of their finances and the executive branch of their government had been located in reykjavik but difficult problems still remained unsolved the all-important controversy regarding iceland's relation to denmark had not been settled and the question of a separate icelandic flag had so far found only a preliminary solution the flag already granted was little more than a decoration restricted to local use in connection with the flag of denmark as icelandic commerce was expanding the flag question was revived it was evident that this was no longer a matter only of national sentiment but of growing practical importance in nineteen fourteen the icelandic steamship company was organized with a capital stock of one million two hundred thousand kroner the icelanders in the united states and canada subscribing a large part of the stock and the icelandic government contributing four hundred thousand kroner four steamers were to be built the first of these the gulf Foss, was launched at copenhagen in nineteen fifteen the question would naturally arise whether icelandic ships in foreign waters should continue to sail under the danish flag in august nineteen seventeen a measure was introduced in the althing requesting the assembly to demand an icelandic merchant flag the proposal was adopted and the icelandic prime minister jan magnusson went to copenhagen to lay it before the king in a meeting of his cabinet november twenty two nineteen seventeen the king refused to sanction the measure in stating the reasons for his refusal he said i cannot sanction the proposal submitted by the icelandic minister but i wish to add that when danish and icelandic views do not coincide negotiation no matter how they may be inaugurated will do more than direct action on a single question to create that good understanding which ought to form the basis for the relations between the two countries after considering carefully the king's words all political parties in iceland agreed to try negotiations the danish rigsdag appointed a commission to meet a similar body of icelandic representatives in reykjavik the danish members arrived in iceland june twenty ninth nineteen eighteen the negotiations were begun at once and on july nineteenth the icelandic telegraphic bureau wired a message that full agreement had been reached regarding the flag question and the relations between iceland and denmark an act of union defining iceland's position was signed by all the delegates and submitted to the danish rigsdag and the icelandic althing after these assemblies had approved the measure it was finally ratified in iceland by a general plebiscite in the all thing the measure was carried by thirty-eight against two votes in the plebiscite twelve thousand forty votes were cast in its favor and only eight hundred and ninety-seven against it on november thirtieth nineteen eighteen it was signed by the king the following day sunday december one iceland was proclaimed a sovereign kingdom in union with denmark according to provisions in the act of union the danish flag dane brog was lowered and the new national flag was hoisted over iceland the city of reykjavik was decorated for the occasion shortly before twelve o'clock the orchestra opened the program for the occasion by playing the icelandic national anthem eld gamum la Isafold minister eggers then spoke saying in closing by sanctioning the act of union the king has carried out the thoughts of frederick the eighth who possessed the most intimate understanding of our affairs to-day the king has decided to grant iceland its own flag which is now raised over the icelandic state our sovereign has won the sympathy of every icelander the flag is the symbol of our sovereignty of the most resplendent thoughts of our nation the honor of our flag is our national honor we pray god the almighty to preserve our state and our king we pray god to help us to carry our flag to honor may the good fortune of king and people follow it so let us hoist this flag as the flag rose to the top of the staff the orchestra played the icelandic flag song and the danish man of war islands falk lying in the harbour fired a salute of twenty-one shots captain lork of the islands falk spoke for denmark the orchestra played the danish national song king christian and along lived the king echoed through the city a speech of a speech by city judge johannesson president of the all thing was followed by three times three cheers for the king from copenhagen the following telegram was received from king christian the ten after signing in meeting of my cabinet the danish icelandic act of union which upon preliminary negotiations between danish and icelandic delegates has been passed by the legislative assemblies of the two countries and ratified in iceland by a general vote and after having determined the appearance and use of the icelandic flag i wish to express the hope that this new arrangement may form the basis for a happy national development and cordial relations between the two peoples i also send my dear and faithful icelanders my royal greetings and best wishes for iceland's future success and happiness danish icelandic act of union 
denmark and iceland are free and sovereign states united by a common king danish citizens in iceland are to enjoy equal rights and privileges with the citizens of iceland and vice versa the citizens of each country are exempt from military service in the other country access to fishing within the maritime jurisdiction of both countries is equally free to danish and icelandic citizens regardless of residence danish ships in icelandic harbors have the same rights as icelandic ships and vice versa denmark will act in iceland's behalf in foreign affairs in the ministry of foreign affairs there will be a representative appointed in consultation with the government of iceland and familiar with icelandic conditions attaches who are well informed on icelandic affairs shall be appointed to the already existing consulates and legations all agreements entered into by denmark with foreign countries and already published shall in so far as they concern iceland be in force for that country also agreements ratified by denmark after the proposed law of confederation has gone into effect shall not be binding upon iceland without the express consent of the icelandic authorities concerned until such time as iceland shall decide to take charge of the inspection of fisheries in whole or in part this duty will be performed by denmark under the danish flag the monetary system shall continue to be the same for both countries as at present so long as the scandinavian monetary system exists should iceland desire to establish her own coinage the question of acknowledgment by sweden and norway of the coins and notes stamped in iceland will have to be settled by negotiation with those countries denmark's supreme court has jurisdiction in icelandic cases until iceland shall decide to institute a supreme tribunal of her own until then one member of the supreme court shall be an icelander matters of importance to both countries such as coinage trade customs navigation mails telegraphs and radio telegraphs administration of justice weights and measures as well as financial arrangements shall be regulated by agreements of the authorities of both countries the sum of sixty thousand krona contributed annually by denmark to iceland shall be discontinued and instead denmark shall establish two funds of one million krona each one at the university of copenhagen and one at the university of reykjavik for the promotion of intellectual intercourse between the two countries there shall be established an advisory body of at least six members one half from iceland and the other half from denmark to be appointed by the althing and the rigsdag respectively to deal with any bills brought forward in the parliament of one country which also touch the interests of the other if differences of opinion should arise concerning the provisions of this law of confederation which cannot be adjusted by the governments they shall be laid before a court of arbitration consisting of four members two to be appointed by each country this court of arbitration shall settle differences by a plurality of votes and in case of a tie the matter shall be submitted to an arbitrator appointed alternately by the swedish and the norwegian governments this law of confederation may be revised until the year nineteen forty upon the request of either the rigsdag or the althing the agreement may be abrogated only by a two-thirds vote of each parliament which must afterwards be confirmed by a plebiscite denmark will communicate to foreign powers its acknowledgment of iceland as a sovereign power in accordance with the provisions of this law of confederation at the same time denmark will announce that iceland declares itself to be perpetually neutral and has no naval flag of its own in accordance with the provisions in the act of union a danish minister is stationed in reykjavik as denmark's official representative in iceland the icelanders are similarly represented in denmark through their own minister in the summer of nineteen twenty one elaborate preparations were made in reykjavik to receive the royal family who were to visit iceland for the first time in their history the icelanders were to greet a king and queen of their own during the last two weeks reykjavik has been the busiest city in the world says a report from iceland of june twenty seventh nineteen twenty one houses have been painted streets repaired and many hundred people have been busy decorating the city for months the committee on arrangements has laboured to make the reception an honour 
to iceland in the forenoon of june twenty sixth the danish man-of-war valkyrie carrying the royal visitors entered the harbour of reykjavik a triumphal arch had been erected where the king and queen were received by the city authorities and greeted by the huzzas of the populace at twelve o'clock the bishop of iceland conducted religious services in the cathedral church then followed a royal reception in the althing building where the king spoke in icelandic to the assembled people in response to an address of welcome by the althing president gifts from the people of iceland were presented to all the members of the royal family the queen receiving a beautiful national costume in describing the festival editor sven paulsen wrote in the berlingsik tinda at seven o'clock in the evening the streets of reykjavik resounded with huzzas and orchestral music the royal pair were coming the king wore a general's uniform the queen was attired in icelandic festival costume wearing a golden diadem with white veil flowing over a black silk dress ornamented with gold embroidery and fastened about the waist with a belt of pure gold the costume a present from the women of iceland to their first queen cost seventy thousand kroner queen alexandra looked very beautiful in it and the people were highly elated at the royal dinner icelandic girls in national costume waited on the guests the royal family also visited thingveller where they were received by a large number of people in national attire many of whom had come from a great distance to greet the king and queen of iceland when the king ascended the mount of laws a body of icelandic trumpeters struck up their solemn measures as a welcome to the distinguished guests from this old centre of icelandic national life on july one the royal family visited the great waterfall Gullfoss, stopping on the way in a typical icelandic farmhouse which the king examined thoroughly with great interest after a trip to geyser they proceeded to olfusa to view the great suspension bridge spanning that stream on saturday july two the royal visitors were brought in automobiles to the waterfall irafals whence they returned to reykjavik on sunday the royal family attended religious services in the cathedral church at one o'clock the king gave a luncheon at the royal residence for the icelandic officials and the officers of the men of war valkyrie heimdall phila and beskiturin forming the royal escort squadron the afternoon was spent in viewing men's and women's gymnastic exhibitions and national sports monday july four the royal family left reykjavik on the man-of-war valkyrie sailing to hafnarfjord where they embarked on the steamer island for a trip to greenland before returning to denmark before departing king christian the tenth created an icelandic order of knighthood the order of the falcon with the three classes grand cross commanders and knights the insignia of the order is a white enamel star-shaped cross with gilt edges in the centre of the cross is a blue oval bearing the icelandic symbol a silver falcon ready for flight on the reverse side is the name of the founder of the order in gold on white enamel surrounded by a blue border with the inscription firsty december nineteen eighteen the ribbon of the order is blue with white borders containing a red stripe the same colors as the icelandic flag the knights of the grand cross carry also an eight-pointed star bearing the device of the order the head of the order is king christian x during the last decades political freedom and economic progress have transformed iceland into a prosperous and progressive modern state the old pursuits have become more productive than past generation would have considered possible great national resources are being made available which were wholly unknown in the past and new pursuits are developing which give promise of still greater progress in the future of special importance are the fisheries which of recent years have grown to be the most paying pursuit and chief source of income in the country in, in eighteen ninety five iceland had only seventy fishing vessels in nineteen o two the number had increased to one hundred and forty four iceland has now over twenty steam trawlers over a hundred sail and motor cutters six hundred motor deck boats and about one thousand fishing boats a fishing fleet which gives employment to nearly eleven thousand people or about one-eighth of the population of the country in nineteen thirteen the export of fish products brought a total income of thirteen million three hundred and twenty seven thousand kroner or more than twice the amount derived from animal 
husbandry which gave a return of five million one hundred and ninety five thousand kroner and yet the rich fisheries in icelandic waters have been only partially utilized by the icelanders themselves in nineteen thirteen one thousand four hundred and thirteen fishing steamers and sail ships entered icelandic harbors and there is no sign of any decrease in the vast schools of fish and herring in these waters also in animal husbandry and farming considerable progress has been made though not in the same proportion in nineteen eighteen iceland had twenty four thousand three hundred and eleven cattle six hundred and forty four thousand nine hundred and seventy one sheep and fifty three thousand two hundred and eighteen horses especially important is the development of dairying a pursuit which has been taught the people by the danes just as the valuable herring fishery has been taught them by the norwegians the first icelandic creamery was built in nineteen hundred in nineteen o six the number had been risen to thirty four during the last few years the annual export of butter is valued at five hundred thousand kroner it is thought that dairying in the rich lowlands of southern iceland if properly developed could support the entire present population of the country but because of lack of proper means of transportation dairying can yet be pursued with profit only during the summer months for this reason the project has been set on foot to build a railway about seventy miles in length one hundred and eleven kilometres from reykjavik to thingbeller self os and fjorsa with a short sideline to Irurbaki. this road will open this important district to new economic development daring is now pursued also in northern iceland but lack of transportation facilities makes further progress difficult during the winter the ice-bound harbours are closed to traffic not till the northern districts are connected with reykjavik and southern iceland by railways can their economic possibilities be fully developed in all iceland there are six thousand five hundred and fifty eight farms one half of these are owned by the farmers who till them the other half of the farming population are renters about one-tenth of the soil is owned by the state but the government estates are now being sold as rapidly as possible at low prices and on easy terms relatively the farming population is decreasing in number for some time the number of farms has remained stationary though large areas could yet be cultivated the work of developing new farmsteads cannot be done as the growth of the fisheries and the increase in trade and traffic have attracted the young people to the sea-coast districts in nineteen hundred iceland had a population of seventy nine thousand of which only nine thousand lived in the towns in nineteen fifteen the population was eighty nine thousand fifty nine of which twenty thousand seven hundred and five lived in the towns the growth of population in the decade nineteen ten to nineteen twenty was nine thousand five hundred and thirteen from eighty five thousand one hundred and eighty three in nineteen ten to ninety four thousand six hundred and ninety six in nineteen twenty during the same decade the rural population fell from sixty five thousand nine hundred and eighty seven in nineteen ten to sixty five thousand thirty two in nineteen twenty but great progress is being made towards better conditions in rural life the old primitive farmhouses built of sod and stone are disappearing and fine modern homes are built of lumber or concrete usually two stories high with large windows and jutting chimneys the new houses are built according to american far west models says a recent writer a similar transformation is being wrought in the means of communication and travel fifty years ago there was not a bridge across a single river nor was there a wagon in use in all iceland now two-fifths of the revenues of the country are used for building roads and improving the means of communication fine roads are being built in all parts of the country so that the old horseback caravans will soon be replaced by wagons and automobiles from reykjavik a fine road has already been built to thingbeller and another almost to hecla all great rivers have been spanned by costly bridges and fine highways are already in use along the valleys and streams in all parts of the country fifteen times a year the mail caravans go to all parts of the island so that every home receives its mail regularly houses have been built and equipped at regular intervals along the mail routes as places of refuge for the mail carriers in stormy weather in nineteen o six a telegraphic cable was laid to iceland and the first telephone lines were constructed in the island in nineteen fourteen the icelandic steamship company was organized regular steamship service is now maintained with denmark and around the whole coast of iceland sixty places being entered by the steamers on their trip around the island motor boats are also plying the navigable rivers before many more years the tourists may be able to travel on electric railway trains from one place to another in the saga islands 
nations industry is still of little importance in iceland but possibilities exist of great future development in this field lignite or coal is found in several places and beds of bituminous coal have also been discovered these coal deposits will probably be of value only as fuel for private homes but iceland possesses a great supply of water power which can be made available as motor power in industries and on electric railways of the countries of europe france has the greatest amount of water power amounting to ten million horsepower norway has about seven million five hundred thousand sweden about six million austria six million italy six million germany one million five hundred thousand spain one million five hundred thousand england three hundred three thirty three thousand switzerland one hundred and sixty seven thousand the amount of water power in iceland is not definitely known but it has been estimated to be not less than two million five hundred thousand horsepower or as much as that of germany switzerland spain and england combined foreign companies have already purchased great icelandic waterfalls and the building of railways and factories already planned will undoubtedly be begun in the near future a fair index to the growth of prosperity in iceland in late years is the rapidly increasing volume of trade in the period eighteen eighty to eighteen ninety the yearly export and import together amounted to ten million kroner in nineteen ten this total had amounted to thirty million kroner in nineteen thirteen before the outbreak of the world war thirty six million kroner the export being sixteen million kroner the import nineteen million kroner in recent years this rapid growth of commerce has continued the official statistics show the greater share of this trade is carried on with denmark great britain norway sweden united states spain and germany in the period eighteen eighty six to eighteen ninety the average number of ships which came to iceland from foreign lands every year was two hundred and sixty four since that time that average has increased in nineteen twenty the population of iceland numbered ninety four thousand six hundred and ninety six a correspondent from reykjavik to the danish paper berlingske tadinda wrote in nineteen twenty one there is scarcely another scandinavian city which in the last fifty years has experienced such a development as the capital of iceland when christian the ninth in eighteen seventy four landed in reykjavik it consisted of a cluster of houses around a small church at the upper end of faxi bay many of the houses were built of sod and stone the town gave the general impression of a primitive village or a group of fishermen's homes when frederick the eighth and members of the danish government and rigsdag landed in iceland in nineteen o seven reykjavik had become a city of about ten thousand people but the king and members of the rigsdag had to land on a small pier on the open shore and the town with its unpaved streets and low houses irregularly placed gave the impression of a large country town now at the time of the visit of christian the tenth and queen alexandra the town is nearly twenty thousand people and is not only a real city but it deserves to be called the capital of iceland when the royal squadron entered the harbour a beautiful sea-coast town lay stretched before it with an elegantly constructed harbour ready to receive the king and queen stood the population of a well-built capital a city with government buildings churches colleges public library museums hospitals in short the whole complex equipment belonging to a european capital the age of the small tripping horses is past automobiles and motor trucks speed through the streets of reykjavik the old general stores with their collections of all sorts of wares from ship anchors oil coats and empty herring barrels to candy and millinery have been replaced by stores of the latest model carrying only special lines of goods some so large and well equipped that they compare favourably with the stores in any scandinavian city down by the harbour the only great commercial harbour in the north atlantic great steamers are loading and unloading at the wharves instead of as formerly when the goods had to be brought from the ships to the shore and from the shore to the ships and barges reykjavik is also a fleet of modern trawlers and large motor fishing boats not equalled in any danish city not even in esberg the city is a real capital where nearly all of what iceland possesses of political administrative and academic talent and ability is gathered an evidence of the high moral character of the icelandic people is the almost total absence of crime in their country in nineteen o four sixteen persons were convicted of crimes or minor offences one being a woman in nineteen o five and nineteen o six the number of cases were twenty two men and two women and twenty eight men and five women respectively but only two-thirds of the accused received a prison sentence the prisons in iceland usually stand almost empty when we consider that 
more than one-fifth of the whole population live in seacoast towns and are engaged in trade and fisheries this is so unique a record that we must give the icelanders the credit of being the most orderly and law-abiding people in the world End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of history of iceland by canute gyurset this librivox recording is in the public domain icelandic immigration the icelanders in america a feature of singular interest and importance in the modern history of iceland as of the other european countries is the emigration to america a movement in which also the icelanders have participated the economic development which during the last few decades has wrought such improvement in social conditions everywhere in the north had not made itself felt at the time when the real emigration from iceland began some progress had been made but the condition of the peasantry and the poorer classes was so little improved that emigration to america from all scandinavian countries was increasing rapidly under the stimulus of improved facilities for ocean travel this migratory movement of the venturesome and depressed of europe to the new world with its hopes and opportunities exerted its influence also on iceland the economic conditions there were still very unfavorable and the bitter and hitherto fruitless struggle for political liberty had led leading newspapers to advocate emigration as the only solution of the pending national questions emigration from iceland to the united states and canada may be said to have begun in eighteen seventy but even long before that time a few icelanders who had been converted to mormonism had sought new homes in america in eighteen fifty one two icelandic mormons from copenhagen came as missionaries to the vast in eighteen fifty five a few persons who had accepted that faith among others samuel bjarnason and his wife emigrated to the united states founding a settlement at spanish fork in the state of utah other converts followed later in eighteen fifty seven thirteen persons from iceland arrived in the colony of late years many of the icelandic mormons have returned to the lutheran faith and the colony at spanish fork is neither large nor prosperous in eighteen sixty three the first emigrants to brazil departed from iceland under the leadership of magnus ericsson a few left later at different times going by way of copenhagen to germany where they joined german emigrants going to south america but this emigration was never of great importance and no icelandic settlement was founded there in eighteen seventy three many persons signified their desire to go to brazil but as magnus ericsson who had hitherto acted as guide declared that he would no longer act as leader of emigrants going to that country they joined another group going to the united states and canada the immigration to the united states begun in eighteen fifty five was continued in eighteen seventy when four young icelanders from i Rarbaki came to milwaukee they settled on washington island wisconsin thus founding the second icelandic settlement in america a few more immigrants arrived the following year but although the colony still exists it has never grown beyond a small group of families in eighteen seventy two almost three hundred icelanders came to america among these were the leaders sig triger Jonasson, one of the founders of the large icelandic colony new iceland paul thorlaxson who founded the icelandic settlements in north dakota and hansby thorgrimson who took the lead in founding the icelandic lutheran synod in america in eighteen seventy three a ship carrying one hundred and fifty three emigrants sailed from Akureyri in northern iceland to canada thirty more emigrants who found no room on the ship followed later in the fall all agreed to settle in the same place but when they arrived at their destination some went to nova scotia and a few to milwaukee wisconsin but the greater number founded a colony on the russo river near muskoka ontario where the post office hecla was built many men who later became prominent among the icelanders in america were in this group of immigrants among others the poet stephen g stevenson baldwin l baldwinson and jan jansen bardal in that year came also rev jan bjarnason who later became so prominent a leader in the icelandic church in america 
he had been moved to come to america with his wife through letters from his friend paul thorlaxen who had entered the theological seminary of the german lutheran missouri Snedded at st louis bjarnson and his wife came to milwaukee and after a few days proceeded to st louis where they met paul thorlaxen rev bjarnson did not enter the theological seminary in st louis but went instead to decor iowa where he became assistant to rev v corin one of the leading ministers of the norwegian lutheran synod in january eighteen seventy four he was appointed teacher in luther college decora iowa but in the spring of that year he resigned and returned to milwaukee wisconsin when news was brought that iceland had received a constitution the icelanders in milwaukee arranged a celebration in which all the icelanders in the city took part speeches were made by rev jan bjarnson by the editor jan olafsson who had accompanied him from reykjavik and others at this time the an icelandic society icelandig avelig was founded for the purpose of promoting intellectual interest among the icelanders in america a movement was also set on foot to find a suitable place for an icelandic colony where the immigrants might dwell together as wisconsin did not seem to offer the desired opportunity committees were appointed to investigate where a suitable location might be found sigvis magnuson and jan haldorson were sent to nebraska as a result of their visit a few icelanders settled in that state but it was not selected as a site for the new colony another committee led by olafur olafsson and jan olafsson was sent to alaska about their expedition jan olafsson later published a book alaska lysing alandi aglan custom etc washington d c eighteen seventy five probably the first icelandic book printed in america but alaska was not found to be a suitable place for a colony the canadian government carried on active work and sent paid agents to iceland to encourage immigration to canada in september eighteen seventy four the steamer st patrick brought three hundred and sixty five icelandic immigrants directly to quebec at the entrance to the harbor a governor officer accompanied by johann arngrimson who had come to america in eighteen seventy two met them and sought to persuade them to settle in canada many of the immigrants said that they intended to go to the united states but after some negotiations they entered into an agreement with the government representatives promising to settle in canada on the following conditions they were to enjoy full liberty and right of citizenship at once on the same terms as native-born citizens a sufficiently large and suitable tract of land for a colony was to be granted them they were to preserve unhindered their personal rights their language and their nationality for themselves and for their descendants forever the reason for this agreement was that the immigrants believed that there was more freedom in the united states than in canada journeying westward from quebec to ontario they founded a settlement at kinmount about sixty miles north of toronto but the land here proved to be so poor that the settlers grew discontented and wished to find a better location in the fall of eighteen seventy four johann arngrimson representative of the canadian government came to kinmount and urged the discontented settlers to move to nova scotia where a suitable tract for a settlement would be granted them about eighty families promised to go they moved early in the spring of eighteen seventy five and others followed later in the summer about thirty miles from the coast of, at a place which they called elgschether they founded the settlement markland but as the land was stony and covered with timber it was little suited for cultivation the following year more people from iceland came to the settlement it is thought that it numbered at one time about two hundred people brynjolfur brynjolfsson was the leader in the settlement in all things pertaining to religious and educational work he was a gifted man and worked with untiring zeal to promote the welfare of his people but the settlement did not prosper in eighteen eighty one to eighteen eighty two most of the settlers moved away to join their countrymen in other localities in eighteen seventy five goon logger peterson and his wife who had settled in wisconsin in eighteen seventy three moved to lyon county minnesota more settlers from wisconsin joined them the following year and in eighteen seventy seven many immigrants from iceland arrived people of other nationalities also settled there but the icelanders are very numerous around minneota and marshall minnesota
in eighteen seventy eight the icelanders in the settlement organized a society for the purpose of printing books and papers for establishing a common burial ground and for gathering together for the reading of the scriptures on sundays the first clergyman who visited the settlement and helped to organize congregations was the pioneer leader rev paul thorlaxon who visited the settlement in eighteen seventy seven and eighteen seventy eight four congregations were organized all of which were served by the same minister in eighteen ninety seven an icelandic quarterly the canarin was founded edited by b b jansen and rev janus a sigurdsson of Acre, north dakota this periodical continued to appear till nineteen o five in nineteen o two the icelanders of minnesota began the publication of a monthly edited by thordur thordurson m d and rev bjorn b jansen the periodical ceased to appear in nineteen o eight among the prominent men reared in this settlement is hon g b bjornson editor of the minneota mascot for years a leader in the minnesota state legislature as the icelanders in eastern canada were dissatisfied with conditions in the localities where they had settled lord dufferin governor-general of canada who was very friendly to them moved the canadian government to grant them financial aid to move their colony to a new site john taylor who had become acquainted with the icelandic settlers at kinmount offered to serve as guide in searching for a better location in eighteen seventy five a committee headed by sigtrager johnson was sent from muskoka under the guidance of taylor to find a suitable place for a colony they selected a strip of land along the west shore of lake winnipeg calling it new iceland in the fall of that year a few settlers from ontario arrived in the new colony the following year about one thousand two hundred immigrants arrived from iceland the colony grew so fast that it already numbered about one thousand four hundred people the largest icelandic settlement in america on january fourth eighteen seventy six a general meeting was held and a council of five was chosen to act as temporary government for the colony shortly after new iceland had been founded the two most influential church leaders among the icelanders in america rev paul thorlaxen and rev jan bjarnason arrived in the colony paul thorlaxen who had served some norwegian congregations in an icelandic congregation which he had organized in wisconsin and had served as missionary preacher in other icelandic settlements was called as minister by settlers in new iceland in eighteen seventy six he arrived in the colony october ninth eighteen seventy seven and organized the first congregation there jan bjarnason who after leaving luther college had worked for a time as assistant on the norwegian newspaper scandinavian and bud sticken was also called as minister by some settlers in new iceland in eighteen seventy six in the summer of that year he visited the colony and on november eighth the following year he arrived there with his wife and entered upon his work as pastor and church organizer between these two leaders a church controversy soon arose which divided the icelanders in america into two parties paul thorlaxen adhered to the conservative lutheran views of the german lutheran missouri synod and the norwegian lutheran synod he sought to prevail on his countrymen to associate themselves in church work with the norwegians of the norwegian lutheran synod but jan bjarnason opposed the plan he considered the synod too conservative as he rejected the doctrine of the verbal inspirations of the bible and differed with rev thorlaxen also on other doctrinal questions the meetings held between the two leaders and their adherents march twenty five to twenty six eighteen seventy eight and march seventeen eighteen eighteen seventy nine to discuss these questions only widened the breach between the two parties during the first years in the colony the settlers suffered much as they were poorly equipped to live in the severe climate of canada an epidemic also broke out which carried away hundreds of people in these trying days the canadian government granted them a loan to aid them and rev paul thorlaxen solicited aid among the norwegians in the united states who contributed one thousand three hundred dollars to the relief fund in eighteen eighty jan bjarnason had to go to iceland to visit his dying father he bid farewell to his congregations and did not return to new iceland in eighteen seventy seven steps were taken to organize a more permanent government for the colony two meetings were assembled each choosing five men to act as a committee in drafting laws for the people these laws were later submitted to a general meeting assembled at the town of gimli february five 
eighteen seventy seven the colony was divided into four settlements the fithin nest by goth arnis by goth flots by goth and the micklay yar by goth at an election held february fourteen each settlement chose five men to act as a local council each council chose one of its members as president bithorsturyori the four presidents formed a general council for the whole colony the nylandu roth with a president and vice-president this council had charge of all matters common to the four settlements a constitution for the colony was framed at a meeting held january eleventh eighteen seventy eight this fundamental law the only one of its kind among the icelanders in america remained in force till eighteen eighty seven new iceland was a state with its own constitution laws and government even its own language and distinct nationality no other people than the icelanders were allowed to settle within its borders but in all except local affairs it remained under the authority of the canadian government in eighteen seventy seven a company was organized in the colony to print and publish books and papers the Naya islands a printing press was bought in minneapolis and on september ten of that year the first icelandic paper in america the fram Fari, began to appear its editor being haldor Briam. in eighteen eighty the paper ceased to be published but although it lived only a short time it is of great importance as a source for the early history of the colony other papers were published later dags brun eighteen ninety three to eighteen ninety six the periodical savava eighteen ninety five to nineteen o four bergamalio eighteen ninety seven to nineteen o one balder nineteen o three to nineteen ten nye dogsbrun nineteen o four to nineteen o six and jim lunger nineteen ten to nineteen eleven the colony of new iceland is still prosperous and remains the most exclusively icelandic settlement in america it has been represented in the manitoba legislature by several able men born in iceland first by captain sig Triger, jonasson and later by b l balwinson and s thorvaldson the religious controversy between the adherents of paul thorlikson and jan bjarnason together with the hardships caused by poverty and epidemics led to an emigration from new iceland which resulted in the founding of new icelandic settlements in other localities in the spring of eighteen seventy nine reverend paul thorlikson accompanied by several leading men of the colony set out to search for a suitable location for a new settlement a tract in prembina county in the northeastern corner of north dakota was selected some settlers from new iceland arrived there the, that same summer and many people came the following year from new iceland nova scotia and from icelandic settlements in wisconsin and minnesota before the new settlement in pembina county was ten years old it was one of the largest icelandic colonies in america in eighteen eighty the first congregations were founded there by rev paul thorlikson the father of this new and flourishing settlement on march twelfth this gifted and faithful worker died deeply mourned by all his countrymen brave gentle and resourceful a true and devoted leader he had worn himself out in untiring effort to aid his people in their various needs in that year rev hans b thorgrimson graduated from the theological seminary of the missouri synod in st louis he was called as pastor by the newly organized congregations in pembina county arriving there in the fall of eighteen eighty three at this time a congregation was also organized in the town of pembina the real centre of the icelandic settlement in eighteen eighty four thorgrimson organized new congregations farther west in the settlement and also at grafton in marshall county north dakota where some icelanders had settled that same year he proposed that the icelandic congregations in america should unite and organize an icelandic lutheran synod at a meeting of delegates from various places assembled at mountain in pembina county january twenty three to twenty five eighteen eighty five this proposal was discussed a constitution for a general church organization was drafted and submitted to the various congregations for their approval on june twenty fourth eighteen eighty five a new meeting was assembled at winnipeg where the proposed synod was organized by the thirteen congregations which had already signed the constitution rev jan bjarnason who had returned from iceland in eighteen eighty four and had become pastor of icelandic congregations in winnipeg was elected president of the synod
he was also chosen editor of the church paper Samminingen, which began to appear in december of that year in nineteen o five the icelandic synod had thirty seven congregations in nineteen nineteen the number had increased to fifty eight in eighteen eighty six rev hans b thorgrimson moved to south dakota where he took charge of some norwegian congregations he returned in nineteen hundred and continued to serve the congregations in pembina county till nineteen twelve many icelanders in the pembina settlement have become prominent in the public affairs of their state among these men may be mentioned hon d j laxdahl land commissioner of north dakota deceased hon m b brynjolfsson a brilliant lawyer and political leader also deceased in both houses of the state legislature pembina county has been repeatedly represented by men born in iceland while new iceland was being settled many icelanders came to winnipeg the chief point of communication in that part of canada many remained in the city forming a colony which dates its origin from the same years as that of new iceland this flourishing city in time attracted so many icelanders that it became the centre of the icelandic settlements and of icelandic intellectual life in america already in eighteen seventy seven an icelandic society the icelandinga felig was organized there for the purpose of guiding icelandic immigrants in finding homes and settlements founded by their own countrymen so that they should not become scattered everywhere another aim of the society was to provide instruction for children and young people both in the english language and in their own mother tongue to cultivate among their people love of reading and intellectual pursuits and to aid the sick and needy a sunday school was organized in which children received instruction in religion and in the icelandic language in eighteen seventy seven teachers were hired and a general public school was maintained throughout the winter instruction was given in writing arithmetic english and icelandic forty pupils being in regular attendance in eighteen eighty one the icelanding of feleg was reorganized under the name of fram the aim of the society should be to further everything which might be of benefit to the icelandic people in america a school committee was chosen and money was collected to support the school which had hitherto been maintained through the efforts of private individuals the same year the society of icelandic women was organized in the city the aim being to aid icelandic immigrants who were arriving every year in large numbers the society also labored and contributed money to the support of the icelandic school for this purpose one of the members a young girl gudrun jan's daughter gave one half of her yearly earnings of fifteen dollars a month a striking illustration of the devoted self-sacrifice which characterized the brave icelandic immigrants in eighteen eighty three two years after the society was organized the treasurer reported that about five hundred dollars had been contributed to various charitable purposes and that a cash balance of one hundred and fifty dollars remained in the treasury the society continued to exist till eighteen ninety both paul thorlakson and jan bjarnason had visited winnipeg on their journeys to new iceland but no icelandic congregation was organized in the city till eighteen seventy eight when rev jan bjarnason organized the trinity congregation the real growth of this congregation began in eighteen eighty four when rev bjarnason returned from iceland to become its pastor it was then reorganized under the name of the first lutheran church of winnipeg a church was erected in eighteen eighty seven in nineteen o four it was destroyed by fire and a new church was built the same year finer than any icelandic church which had hitherto been built there are now four icelandic churches in the city and several societies rev jan jarnason made the church service as simple as possible discarding cassock and chanting the most characteristic features of the lutheran ritual he was not only a learned man and an able speaker but an inspiring leader more highly beloved and honored by his people than any other icelander in america when he died in nineteen fourteen rev bjorn b jansen was elected president of the icelandic lutheran synod a small unitarian synod has also been founded by the icelanders in winnipeg many icelandic papers and periodicals have been published in winnipeg leifer eighteen eighty three to eighteen eighty six heimskringla which began to appear in eighteen eighty six logsburg which has been published since eighteen eighty eight and many periodicals about six thousand icelanders are now living in that city most of them are prosperous not a few being wealthy merchants and men of prominence in civic life hon thomas h jansen who has represented central winnipeg in the legislature is one of the leading men in western canada 
one of the leading surgeons in this part of canada is dr b j branson f a c s professor in the winnipeg medical institute from the mother colony on lake winnipeg sprang other icelandic settlements in canada one of the most prosperous of these is the one at argyle in southwestern manitoba founded in eighteen eighty by sigurdur christopherson and other settlers from new iceland many icelanders have settled in saskatchewan alberta and british columbia in the saskatchewan legislature one of their leading men hon w h paulson has served as representative groups of icelanders are also found in various cities in the united states and canada in chicago and minneapolis they have settled in considerable numbers many also live in seattle bellingham victoria marietta blaine point roberts and other places on the pacific coast the icelanders in america now number about twenty thousand about one-third of them belong to the icelandic lutheran synod one of the most notable traits of the icelanders in america as well as in their own country is their love of learning poetry and intellectual pursuits even as immigrants in a new environment and living under difficult circumstances they did everything possible to educate their children and to foster intellectual life among their people in the newly established settlements literary societies were founded congregations were organized schools and reading circles were established papers and periodicals were published as soon as the settlers had thatched their first cottages well they were yet if few in numbers they began to consider the possibility of founding a higher school preferably a college for their own young people in eighteen eighty four a young icelander freeman b anderson from toronto came to winnipeg he urged that a higher school should be established for the icelandic young people much interest was awakened and a committee was appointed to promote the plan but the difficulties to be overcome were found to be so great that the plan was abandoned it was revived at the yearly meeting of the icelandic synod in eighteen eighty seven by rev frederick j bergman and fridjan fridrikson the president of the synod rev john bjarnason had received one hundred dollars as pay for his service as editor of the church paper this sum he donated as the beginning of a fund to be raised for establishing an icelandic college under the auspices of the synod since that time the college question was brought up at every yearly meeting of the church and money was gradually collected for the college fund in nineteen hundred the question of a higher icelandic institution of learning took a new turn it was then decided to create chairs in icelandic in wesley college winnipeg belonging to the methodist church and in augustavus adolphus college of the swedish augustana synod at st peter minnesota in nineteen o one rev frederick j bergman was appointed teacher in icelandic in wesley college under the auspices of the icelandic lutheran synod which also paid his salary he continued to serve till nineteen o nine when he was succeeded by runolfer martinson who served till nineteen thirteen in nineteen o five another chair in icelandic was established at gustavus adolphus college st peter minnesota magnus magnuson of cambridge england a nephew of a Riker magnuson was appointed professor serving till nineteen o nine when the chair was discontinued the desire of the icelanders to establish a higher educational institution of their own was finally realized in nineteen thirteen when a resolution was passed at the yearly convention of the icelandic lutheran synod assembled at mountain north dakota to establish an icelandic institution of learning in winnipeg canada before the next yearly meeting of the church rev jan bjarnason died and the school founded according to the resolution of the previous year was given the name of jan bjarnason academy rev runolfer martinson was elected president of the institution during the first year it had thirty students and a faculty of three teachers the aim of the school is to bring the young people who attend it under christian influence to preserve for them as far as possible their icelandic heritage and to prepare them for useful service in church and state in nineteen fourteen efforts were made to raise an endowment for the school the jan martinson memorial fund this fund now yields a yearly income of about one thousand four hundred dollars the other necessary means for the operation of the school are derived from tuition fees and private contributions unexpected difficulties were created by the outbreak of the world war collection of funds and the erection of suitable buildings had to be postponed until peace and normal conditions should again invite a distraught generation to constructive efforts 
what the icelanders in america themselves have been unable to accomplish for the promotion of scholarly interest in their literature and culture has at times been done by american higher institutions of learning which have created extensive collections of icelandic books and are offering courses of instruction in older icelandic language and literature the largest collection of this kind has been created at cornell university ithaca new york through the initiative of professor willard fisk formerly librarian of the university the collection which is now in the charge of a special custodian professor haldor hermansson is considered to be the largest icelandic library outside of iceland end of chapter nineteen end of history of iceland by knut gyurset